Series, which is a message queuing platform used by most companies. You can't find the companies not doing MQ series. And I was uh, early 30, uh, early 40, early 40, right? And uh, then I bumped into his book that most of you do, that, that, that attended my lecture know, right? Uh, about enterprise application integration pattern. And I saw this book and thought, this man must be a genius. And he must be 130 years old. Because this <laughs> Both were wrong. <laughs> because, because this contains all the knowledge I always wanted to have about message curing and messaging. And what I tell everybody in the lecture, and I still mean this is the best textbook in computer science I ever read. And, and I still mean it, I still mean it. It's a pleasure to read it, it contains absolutely true knowledge, absolutely pragmatic <laughs> knowledge. And then, by chance, I bumped into him, and I was shocked that he was even younger than me. <laughs> I was absolutely shocked. So this was the time when he worked at ThoughtWorks. Sure. It's, a, it's a consultancy company, and he was doing consultant in this messaging arena, and he had time as a consultant to travel around, and he spent all the nights in the hotel writing the textbook. This is what you told me. Sure. We didn't discuss about girlfriends. So, yeah. so, um, and then he changed at the sudden and went to Google, right? And uh, when he was at Google, I didn't understand why I got no, I didn't understand why I got to go. But then at the sudden, he changed again and he said, ah, oh, Frank, what do you think about the German company? And the answer said, well, German companies are very solid. It's a good idea. <laughs> and then he became the chief Sorry. architect of Allianz. And after a couple of years, he left after five years. But recently I met his former boss, the CEO of Allianz, and he said, wow, Craig, that was so fantastic, right, why did he leave, blah, 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 blah. And then he went back to Google again. And now he is a freelancer. Correct. Since a couple of days. Free and a freelancer, yes. right? And Gregor knows a lot of stuff of consulting, high um, uh, CX uh, <coughs> type of people, right? His claim is about architectural skills and I'm happy that he accepted the invitation when he still was with Google uh, to give a talk on Architects Elevator. Most of the figures I'm also using in my uh, lecture on architecture of application systems. Great. So I learned from you. Yeah. Hey, go ahead. My pleasure. Always my pleasure. Thank you very much. And yes, I'm free as in freelancer and free to decide. So this is finally Frank has been inviting me to Summersock many, many, many times. I could never get any employer to fund any travel to Crete. But now, June, since, since you are poor, you could come. Exactly. Now that I'm poor and I pay myself, I'm actually here. So I'm proud and happy. I'm proud and happy and, and very satisfied to be here. So, a couple of things I want to do today. I'm going to talk mostly about architects and having a very different view of what architecture and architects really mean. Have a tiny bit of a preamble, though, little history lesson my love of service object oriented computing. Yeah, what I noticed here at this workshop is, you know, I hear a lot about Chrome and IoT and all this modern kind of stuff, right? But in the essence of it, it's still service-oriented computing. As Frank sort of alluded to, my history <laughs> um, with service-oriented computing goes back to the book Enterprise Integration Patterns. And here's some um, this great website we built back then, right? This is like under 2003 when both Frank and I were a good bit younger, and it talks about messaging patterns. 
And it would, because it was so great, the website Anno 2019 looks like this, right? It's basically a time capsule. We've never changed it. And it basically shows that some things just do last in our field. We have so much stuff that's changing, a few things are there to stay. And some fundamental architecture patterns and architectural styles, I think, are part of that. So I have another little bit of history, and know a few of, of the folks here. I made an appearance, you know, not, not publishing anything, just, just hanging out, really participating in some panels. And ASOC, that was 2007, so it's about 12 years ago, right? Long time, and yeah, I contributed a chapter. I think this was the same year, actually, conversations between loosely coupled systems. And the conversation topic is actually from the distributed systems perspective, something that interested me quite a bit. And in 2008, I really started writing about conversation patterns. And the way that I always looked at this, it's a sort of orthogonal view to the messaging patterns. Right? The messaging patterns, it looks at a single message and how a message flows through a system. Right? It's a very elegant pipes and filters, sort of classic, you know, architectural style, and it's you know, stateless because all the state is in the messages, it scales, it is decoupled, it's composable, it all has these really nice properties, but when people read our book, they realized there's a few important things missing. So for example, error handling was hardly, hardly there, or sort of complex interactions, you know, back and forth, um, transactional kind of things, reservation sagas, backing out of stuff, right, compensating actions, all of these kind of things were missing because basic messaging doesn't have that vocabulary, right? Basic messaging is the message flows, right? And that's all it does. So I started thinking more about the other half of it rather than following the message to, through a set of participants, can we look at a fixed set of participants and sort of see how the conversation between those two occurs over time. So rather than looking what's so how things flow is so sort of how things go over time between a fixed set of participants, right? So it's like turning this, this whole thing on a different viewpoint. And my favorite example to highlight how that is actually different is we talk about publish, subscribe so much, right? A like very basic pattern pops up, you sort of send one message, and then we subscribe, like it's a message. Well, looking at these two different patterns, actually you have a very different view of what is interesting about how some. First, I always say pub sub is a misnomer because it actually should be sub pub, right? Because first you subscribe, right? You know, do get messages. And I always say pub sub also, the name doesn't match semantically, right? Because subscribing is sort of a meta operation, right? You subscribe once and then publishing you do all the time. So pub sub, yeah, interesting things. Well, you think about it, it's wrong in at least two ways. It's wrongly ordered and the two words have other two different sort of dimensions, yeah? So, so let first do pub sub. But mostly you look at who's subscribing, where does the message go, right? You have a publisher, you have a subscriber. But when you look at the other side, right, the conversational patterns, there's a whole different question that you have. It's like, well, how long do these subscriptions actually last, right? And you get a whole different conversation, you know, sort of pun intended, about leases and timeline and resource allocation, right? Subscriptions, you know, those kind of things. So here you actually think about how does the subscriber happen? And you don't care so much how many subscribers they are, because you don't follow the message as much, but you really look at the life cycle of a subscription. You're like, do I actively need to renew? Do I have a lease? Do I get reminded? Do the messages just stop? Whole different set of questions. So having a lot of fun with this, unfortunately this was in 2008, and then somehow I spent the next 10 years doing random stuff. So the talk today is not about you know, messaging architectures, the talk today is about random stuff. And my current status is actually, my official status, my legal status is I'm unemployed. Because you know, I'm a freelancer, but in Singapore where I live, my visa is an employment visa. So if you want to do independent things, currently I cannot do that in my home country, that's why I'm bouncing around the planet. So technically I'm unemployed, right, as far as legal status in Singapore. However, that has some really nice advantages. I do what I like, right? I'm free as a freelancer. I say freedom is the most important thing. I have almost like no overhead, right? Like all this corporate machinery I don't need to deal with. And finally, I have some more time to think. And then Frank and I were talking about something else, and probably one of the very, very few people here at this event, I also don't have a PhD. And 
never, never quite made it, you know, write my dissertation, right? But if you think about it, it also has enormous advantages. I can say whatever I choose. I don't need to specialize in any field. I'm all over the map, and most importantly, I never need any evidence. Right? I just make it up as I go, and that's another special form of freedom. And I enjoy that freedom very much. With that, we'll talk about architects. So that's, that's for you guys to get to know me a little bit. So now we'll talk about architects. Now, architecture and architects are like special animals, right? You ask three different people what architecture is, you probably get four different answers. And many people say the same things about the architects, the people behind it, that they're all kind of special animals. So when I talk to the typical sort of IT crowd about what it is like to be an architect or chief architect, right? The first image that comes to their mind is usually this guy, right? The Matrix movie. And that's you know, the architect, right? The person who makes all the decisions, who knows everything, right? Who maintains the balance in the universe, etc. It sounds really good until you realize, knowing the movie a little bit, that this is actually not a human being. Right? These are the machines, right? The Matrix movie story, right? So these are the machines, so this is not a human being. So trying to be the all-knowing architect is probably a difficult one for, for us, for us mortals to do. Then another very strange movie, more recent movie, here's Anthony Royal in High Rise. Right? This is the architect who has this grandiose vision of this perfect building that he builds and it absolutely, utterly, totally, completely goes wrong. Right? I'm sure we've seen these kind of architects as well, right? They have this fantastic vision, but reality is far, far away and the two tunnels do not meet. When people look at me as an architect, they get more of the image of this guy. Right? It's like he has Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Right? I think the hair has a little bit has a little bit to do with it and maybe sort of my way, my way of doing things. So it's a very different ways you know, of looking, you know, what is an architect persona? I want to, I want to drill a little bit in to understanding what the role of these people is and why there are so many stories and so many personas of different architects. The first thing is in order to understand why we talk so much about the role of an architect, especially in large organizations, we first need to understand that the role that IT plays has fundamentally changed. And that's why it's so interesting to talk about architects. So now we go from there to a couple of things. You can tell my outfit is architectelevator.com. Since I'm employed, right, I need to advertise at least my domain name, right? So architectelevator.com, if you don't remember anything else, right, that one you should remember. Changing the role of IT. Right? <laughs> These days we talk all the time about digital stuff. Right, digital transformation, digital revolution, digital challenges, digital giants, right? Like you go to any large European or almost worldwide organization, they're gonna have some digital thingy program of one way or another, right? You can almost be guaranteed that they have something digital. <coughs> My answer to that is, well, making things digital is actually stuff we did when Frank and I were still young. Right, a long time ago, right? We, we replaced letters with email, we replaced paper, replaced paper calculation with spreadsheets, right? Sometimes we did funny things like making watches where you need to push a button just to know what time it is, right? But basically the digital thing we did, right? It's done decades ago, before some of you were even born, right? So this whole digital thing is a little bit of a misnomer, right? It's not about making things digital, it's about using the digital technologies to fundamentally change the model. Right? And coincidentally, I think in Germany, some very, very clever people have started to sort of draw a line between digitization and digitalization. My problem is I can never remember which one is which, so I don't use these kind of terms. I basically say whenever you talk about digital, remember that is the technology, which that's cute, right? But we are interested in changing the models. And a great example about what it means to change the model is looking at an encyclopedia. Yeah? Who remembers Encarta? I was like, oh, the old guy is going, okay, yeah, yeah. So my, my generation was a few younger ones, right? <laughs> but Encarta was a great digital encyclopedia, right? And as much as we can make fun of Encarta right now, it's important to remember that in all the mentions, it was superior to the printed encyclopedia. Right, they have more volume, better up to date, multimedia content, easy searchability, right, easy portability. Like on any dimension you draw, it was superior. 
right? It was a superior product to the printed stuff. However, if I ask who's still using Encarta, I hope no hands go up, right? Okay, right? right? And that is because that's all it was. Right? It was a digital replica of a thing that we already had, and it was superior in all categories, but only in those categories that we had defined. It did not question or change the model. And of course, you know, the reason you guys don't use Encarta anymore is all well known because we all use Wikipedia. Right? And Wikipedia is a great example of something that changes the model. It questions some well-known and very settled assumptions. Right? The assumption that knowledge needs to come from experts. Like there's a small group of people who just kind of know better than anybody else. They write it down and share it with everybody. And nobody ever thought about this being strange or unusual, right? People actually, that's a good thing, right? Because you don't want some encyclopedia to have random stuff written in it, right? So nobody ever questioned that model because it served us well until somebody came along and replaced that model with something completely different. And then we start to realize how many of these assumptions we actually carry around. We don't notice these, I call them the beliefs we have or the assumptions we make. We don't really know those until they get challenged. The way this translates back into big business, Frank mentioned I worked at Allianz, is a slogan I often told the Allianz leadership. I said, hey, listen, people, you know, the company is 125 and then like 128 years old, Allianz, right? So I always said, any business model that doesn't depend on IT, you can be pretty sure we found it. Right? We're pretty clever people, and we have 128 years to do so, right? Now, if you use the same logic, it's like, well, everything that's going to come now is going to depend on IT, right? And that is about changing the model. It's not about selling insurance online through an app, because that's making things digital, right? It's rather doing completely different things, like preventing claims altogether through prediction, etc. right? Those are things redefining what insurance means, right? Those are the things that actually change the model. Now, what's interesting is, in how many ways these assumptions are baked into the way organizations and IT organizations function. That's this interesting thing about these assumptions. A, we don't know we have them really until they get challenged, and B, they sort of permeate our thinking and our doing and our organizational structures and our incentive systems. They permeate all these things. So if you look at IT, in order to get anything done in a traditional IT environment, you need one thing. And that's called a project, right? If you don't have a project, right, nothing will happen. You need a project, you need funding, right? And that's what this looks like. You have an as is and a to be, and you make a business case, right? And out of this business case, you make a project, right? And you know, the interesting time in the project is out there, this is where the big party usually happens, the launch party, because people are happy that the project is finished, and we can go back to business as usual. And business as usual means no change, peace of mind, right? Operations run, none of that change stuff. So there's a fundamental belief here that change is a temporary effect that can be bundled into these so-called projects and the result of it can be predicted. And ironically, the big part you have is basically when the first user ever sees your product, right? That's when you celebrate before anybody actually has ever really seen it. Kind of questionable kind of thing, right? Now, how do we break these assumptions, or what does the digital, the so-called digital world bring? Well, the digital world, as we call it, is one of constant change, right? It's like new territory, we're trying things out, we're experimenting, right? There isn't about a target state, so it is fundamentally different, right? And so projects don't make any sense in this environment. But can't you draw it as a step function, like you have a series of right. problems? You can approximate this with like having tiny <coughs> projects, right? You can sort of like, what am I doing today? Or sprints, iterations. That's what the agile people kind of do, right? But in the end, the picture is, you know, basically it's much more moving than resting, right? And there's no big celebrations when resting starts. I always say in the digital world, a project ends when it's dead in the market. I always say Gmail hasn't ended, Google Wave has ended as a project. Right? So where these people, when the project ends, they have a happy celebration launch party, basically when the project ends here, they have the funeral, right? The product is dead. And that shows you that this is not a play of words, right? But it's exactly 180 degrees the opposite of each other, right? When the one people have a happy time, the other people know the product is no longer successful. 
right? And with this come, of course, the skill that you need to have is also fundamentally different, right? This is a scale of, uh, you gotta be a good guesser, right? Like in terms of your to be state and how long it will take and how much money it costs, because to be honest, I don't know, right? So you gotta be a good guesser. On the right hand side, well, it, being a good guesser doesn't hurt, but mostly you need to be a fast learner. And I call this contrast the economies of scale, because here you're building something and you're basically getting the return on investment by just being big, right? It's like the bigger you are, the more return out of this project you get. So the currency is size. On the right hand side, the currency is speed. Now there's an interesting add-on to this that you can put in this. If you're always moving, at least from the zoom out level, right? If you're always moving, absolutes become somewhat meaningless. And you will find that these people use a different language and a different vocabulary, or red line or green line people here. The red line people, they talk about budgets, they talk about headcount, they talk about how much a server costs, like 50,000 euros for a server. They talk in absolutes. On the right hand side, because you're always moving, absolutes become a lot less meaningless. A lot less meaningful, sorry. I always say if you're going down the German Autobahn at 300 kilometers an hour, trying to look at the map exactly where you are isn't that interesting because half a second later you're already somewhere else, right? So it becomes a matter of you know, predicting how long is it still going to take, how fast are you moving, etc. So the folks on the right hand side talk about burn rates, right? They don't talk about budgets, they talk about burn rates. Also, they don't talk about how much the server costs in absolute. They talk about how much the server costs per hour, right? Because that's again the rate. So then that's one of the reasons to the folks on the right hand side, cloud computing seems totally obvious because cloud computing speaks their language. It fits their mental model. I sometimes say these people on the right hand side, they live in the first derivative, right? Because the only constant they have there is the first derivative. So they essentially live in the first derivative and think about it. And if you look at cloud computing, all the data centers that Amazon and Google and all those folks have built, they're all very nice. But you know what? We build data centers for a pretty long time, right? So cloud isn't about a better data center. Cloud is about a different provisioning model and a different billing model. And that's the big difference. The billing model is incremental. It's a rate. It's the first derivative, if you wish, like you know, dollars over time, right? And that's why it fits so well in the right hand box. So, long story on it, but very important to understand that this way of thinking and the vocabulary people use is fundamentally different. It defines how this organization functions. And when you bring cloud computing to the red line people, often what they do is they make a cloud migration project, right? Because that's what they know, and they move everything from one side to the other, and then they're shockingly surprised that the transformation hasn't happened. And obviously not, right? Because they sort of just plucked one infrastructure out, plucked another one in, nothing else has changed. It hasn't gotten them into any economies of speed. So changing the model is much more important, but also much harder. To just underline how different the two things are, you can see how you would operate in these respective economies. Right? An economy of scale is largely you're automating things that already exist. In the insurance business, what did you automate? Risk calculations, claims processing, new accounts, payments, right? These are all things that insurance companies have done for 300 years. Right? So you know what you're after, and that's why you can predict relatively well, right? And you can make a plan, and you can execute a plan, you minimize variation, or right? it's all that classic sort of waterfall kind of kind of things that we have. There's a business case, it's often driven by cost reduction. And to be honest, most corporate IT has done fairly well for itself doing this. Right? Like Allianz has an IT budget of like 3 billion euro a year. Right? So, well, well, so it wasn't like the model was wrong, they did pretty well, but in the end it's a model that was used in a world where you largely replaced existing processes, existing things with IT. Right? And that includes even rather than going to somebody and selling insurance, you know, via an agent, if you just do the same thing about, with a mobile app, right, you change the technology, but not the model. Right? On the right hand side, it's basically exactly the opposite, right? You're discovering new things, different ways, you're testing hypotheses, right? You're running experiments, right? You're learning from these, these experiments. And I have a great anecdote in terms of how difficult it is 
to understand the other world if you live in the, in the left-hand side world. And there was a classic at a large German financial services organization, let's say, somebody came up and said, we need a failure culture, right? Because they hear about these digital kind of companies, they experiment and they fail. And I said, well, we already have a failure culture. Look at all these projects, you know, that tank like 10 million euros, right? We don't need a failure culture. We need on the right hand side, if an experiment fails, basically it means a hypothesis is falsified and it costs them relatively little money when they learn. So it's not about failing, right? This shows you how easy it is to misunderstand how these different things work. It is about learning and yes, most large organizations have a fail like failure culture because they burn a lot of money on projects that are ultimately too big to fail, right? We've seen all that kind of stuff, right? So that's the IT. Now, in that world, there's a very nice model about what role fundamentally IT plays. And it's interesting because most people would say IT is important. But as so often we see, important isn't such a simple word as it sounds. Because important can mean two different things. Important can mean we're happy it's there. And that's certainly true for IT, right? If IT disappeared instantly, an average insurance company or bank would not have a long lifespan, right? A couple of days maybe, right? But it's not going to happen. But there's another axis of important, and that is, is it a differentiator, right? It's also important the power is on. If the power goes out, right, it's not terribly convenient, but it's not a differentiator. It's just like a commodity. Right? And this is what we call in this model from the shift from economies of scale to economies of speed. The IT really moves out of the parity, right? Everybody has some IT, but it's not particularly interesting to it is actually the most interesting thing because all future business models come from the IT. Right? And again, it's a very, very different world worldview. And I come to sort of why being an architect in that environment is actually very interesting. So, have it understood right, there's a, that it's about not about making things digital, right? It's about changing the model. Changing the model means also we go from this economy scale to the economies of speed, right? We basically live in the first derivative, and we have a very different sort of mode in which we operate. And I believe that also very much influences the role of architects, right? Because architects are often sort of the the, the hooking point, the, the pivot point of what's done in the IT, they make a lot of decisions, right? They talk to a lot of people, they make a lot of plans. So I believe the architects are smack dab in the middle of this kind of thing. And what I believe that the most important skill an architect needs to have these days is what I call riding the elevator. And it relates exactly to what we've, what we've just seen. Most organizations have a lot of layers. Right? And that has served well to them. There's like a, there's a penthouse somewhere up here, right, where the decisions get made, right? And then there's sort of the upper management, the upper middle management, the middle middle management, the lower middle management, you know, the upper lower management, right? The middle lower management, the lower lower management. Then there's a program manager, a project manager, a, a product owner, a software engineer, and you know here is the working student who does actually the coding, because he can't pass it on to anybody else, right? So this is what your classic IT organization looks like, or maybe the external consultant, right? He's only the only one who can do it, actually. Exactly, he's the only one who's qualified. Exactly, he's the only one who's qualified because he understands the stuff. Now you can you know, think about, damn, what a dumb model. It's like, yeah, not so fast. And we'll come to this in more detail. The model has a lot of advantages, right? Separation of concerns, for example, right? The people in the penthouse don't need to know how many Docker containers exactly you're running and what version of Kubernetes you have deployed, right? So it has some convenient properties, but of course it also has inconvenient properties. And that is A, communication takes time, right? Because you go through all these levels. And like you said, the people in between are not qualified. So you have the telephone game, the Stille Post kind of problem, right? What comes down in the engine room is generally much different than what started in the penthouse and vice versa. Right? And as you live in these economies of speed, as you imagine things get faster, you start to realize that the disadvantages of this layer architecture, if you wish, right, they start to outweigh the advantages. Now, what do you do? Right? The one thing you can do is try to collapse this thing. Right? Because the digital companies, the so-called digitals, right, the Googles, Facebooks, Amazons, they don't have that many layers. They live in a bungalow, I always say. Highly technical management, Right? Short decision paths, they don't have this. Now the problem is if you blow up the skyscraper, you don't get a bungalow. You get a pile of rubble. Right? If you say I pull out the middle 80 floor, 
course, right? That is not a new building, that's a mess. So you cannot do that, right? At least not, not easily, right? I always say if you're trying to reform middle management, you know, there's a whole village of vacation homes and at least a few hundred children's education at play, right? So that you're not gonna eliminate. That you're not gonna eliminate very quickly. So collapsing doesn't work. So what's the next best thing you can do? Faster connection. Right, you build a better connection between the levels. And that's exactly what I think the architects are best equipped to do. Right? Because the architects are the ones who understand the technology but also understand the context and can communicate up. And these days I judge the value of an architect by how many levels they can span. I don't care about where they start. The problem you always have is the people in the penthouse always think they're more important right, than the others. For me, that doesn't matter. What purely matters is how many floors. Right? And if you go to the top half and you have a great buddy who, who goes to the second half, perfect. Right? As long as you talk to each other, that works. Now, as always, there are a few anti-patterns, and you've seen this. Those are people who ride the architect elevator, but only once to the top, and they stay there. And they're easily identified by their favorite slogan, which is, oh, I used to be technical. Right? And my answer is always like, well, what went wrong? Right? It's like, you know, being technical is great. Like, either you weren't really good at it, or I don't know. Right? It's like, what's wrong? Right? What, what happened? And I often say, in so many companies, it is a valid answer to say, oh, I'm not that technical. Right? Have you ever seen a chief financial officer who said, well, I'm not so good at math? You know, like all this number stuff, you know, division and stuff. You know? They use Excel. Yeah, they use Excel, maybe that. But you think a little bit, if they said, hey, you know, I'm, those math stuff, you know, I'm, I'm in my po I used to be good at math, and now I'm the chief financial officer, a lot of people would have a lot of doubts, right? But somehow in IT, it seems to be allowed to, like, not be, not be technical, right? So yeah, those are the folks who only write the elevator once up. A few sort of conditions, right? As I said, you, you've got to look, in order to make this work, you've got to look at both the organization as well as the technology, right? Because the technology gives us the new tools, but the organization holds these models, these beliefs, this project thinking, all this stuff is baked into the organization, which includes people and processes, right? The culture, if you wish. So you've got to do both. And the other thing is, Riding the elevator and telling each floor a different story doesn't count either, right? You're supposed to connect it. So in the end, you're gonna have the same story, but told in a different way, right? And that's what makes it interesting and challenging. Now, one thing architects need to do is they need to be able to reason about complex systems. Uh, we all know that. Yeah, we do process alliance, right? We deal with systems and we reason about what these systems do. The same is the case here, and you will find some very interesting, oh, I don't have it here, so very just well, wow, I want to talk about my systems. I want to talk about my systems. Some very interesting system effects. And what you may find is that even though the overall state is inefficient, right, all these levels, all this propagation, all this middle management, you will find that most of these parties are actually happy with the current state. So the system has settled itself into a local optimum that you know not to be a global optimum as it generally is. The sum of local optima is not a global optimum, but each party in its own way is happy. And it looks like this. Management lives on a happy illusion that the idea is actually are fairly capable, well run, you know, they're using Docker <laughs> Kubernetes, so they're like cloud enabled, right? I mean, Google watch out, here we come, right? I mean, management just believes, you know, everything is going fairly well. Likewise, these people enjoy their freedom. Because management has like, absolutely no clue what they really do, right? You just tell them, oh, we're building a cloud infrastructure, a big data, machine learning, analytics kind of thing, that's a That sounds really cool, right? And then you do whatever you want, right? And the reason that works is because they're clearly separated by 24 levels of ignorance, right? We call that decoupling. We call that loosely coupled systems, right? It's one of, one of those architecture principles we like. Now, respectively, they're all happy with the current situation. Now, the problem is when you come in as an architect, right, you burst all their bubbles because you basically say, you know what? Yeah, re re you know, once you start writing, you replace the illusion with transparency, right? It's like we always say, it's like turning the lights on in the basement. 
you see all the dirt, right? And the first reaction is, darn it, right? It's full of dirt. So that's what you bring there. You bring some governance to the engine room, like a few checks and balances, right? Gonna happen. And unfortunately, what do you bring into the middle level? You know, you mostly bring in parallelance. Because nobody really needs things of that. So this is one of the things that made change so interesting and what makes it so important to have an architectural mindset to see how these things function. Right? So you have this local optima, you go in and you completely bust the model. With that, I go back slightly on order, the smart guys, so you can deal with it. Those are the things that I feel you need to be able to do at the different levels. Right? You gotta make sure business IT strategy is corrected. That's the fundamental premise of the elevator. If those two things don't match, it doesn't matter how much automation, how much efficiency you put in, right? It's like digging the two tunnels faster, but they don't need you. Right? If, if they're not connected, nothing else can help you, right? And then in order to make this work, right, generally you need to drive change because organizations aren't built this way. They build with highway towers and all these kind of levels. And one of the biggest inhibitors is the complexity we have. Our stuff just is difficult, right? Our software can do a lot of things that it wasn't able to do a while ago. Right? And everything these days is infinitely scalable, self-healing resilient, we can do updates without downtime, right? Canaries, I mean, you name it what we can all do. But the one thing we didn't do is make it simpler. Right? You gotta admit that, right? Even Docker Kubernetes and all the other fancy stuff. Simple, it is not, right? So you need to combat this complexity. It's not gonna disappear. And one of the best ways I know to deal with complexity is explain things better, better models, demystify. And I think we're all a little bit guilty of this because you know life in the engine room can be tough, right? There's all the stuff we need to deal with. And we always love for management to understand all the complexities we have to deal with, right? But what this of course does is carry all this complexity to other levels and people just say, I don't understand this IT stuff. So you need to abstract and model away and that's the best currency you have to sort of get things going. Engine room is a little bit easier, right? We know how stuff works, get friction out of the system, you know, make systems scalable, etc. But that's largely sort of how the elevator looks like. And what we'll do is take a quick, take a quick ride. Jump over this, right? Let's see what an architect thinks like at the different layers of this penthouse or this the skyscraper rather. We starting in the penthouse, right? Up there. In the penthouse, you're dealing with organizational structures, and it's important for you to understand how the IT functions and what is expected from the IT. And generally, corporate IT sits under a CIO, right? The Chief Information Officer. Sometimes people also joke it's called career is over because it's a very <laughs> difficult job, right? Because, yeah, you're supposed to do everything, right? You're supposed to save money, transform the company, be innovative, right? I mean, you're supposed to just know the latest technology, right? CIO is a tough, 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 tough job, right? Now, where does this CIO? into gives you a lot of hint about how this organization is wired, right? We talked about sort of what model, what belief these organizations have, and the org chart gives you an enormous hint. And I would say this is architecture at its finest, right? You're looking at a system, except this time it's not servers, you know, and network, this time it's organizations. You're looking at the interdependencies. And what you find is that if a CIO reports to a chief financial officer, which is the classic sort of model, their main KPI is going to be cost, right? Because the CFO, who is the chief financial officer, is the person who writes the checks, or rather not, right? They try to prevent the company from writing too many checks. So they look at cost reduction. Now, whether you like it or not, the logical right thing to do, if that is the model, is outsource, right? If IT is a pure cost, if you put it somewhere where it's cheaper, you performed in line with your core KPI. You did exactly the right thing. You reduced the cost. Now, we know a million reasons why that model might not apply, but if an organization has that reporting line, you got to assume that that's the model they use. They care about cost. And let's say you come with all your fancy Docker, Kubernetes, Istio, whatever not kind of stuff, and you sell agile, lean, continuous delivery, deployment, spinnaker, I mean, all those kind of things. You're basically selling speed to somebody who only cares about cost. Right? And the effect of that is architects saying, oh, management is stupid, they don't understand, they don't want to listen, they don't get it because you're selling the wrong thing to the wrong person. So it's very important to understand what's in their heads 
and you can read this out of the org chart. Like, a nice sub model is COO. Allianz used this, for example. Right? But the CIO reports to the COO. COO is the chief operations officer, and I sometimes say it's the chief optimization officer. Right? They make sure everything runs efficiently. Right? And it's actually a big step ahead. It's still not where we want to be with our digital stuff, right? But they harmonize, rationalize. The most important thing is they manage by return on investment. The difference between managing by cost and managing by return on investment is a simple car analogy. If you manage by cost, you don't get an oil change because it costs money, right? 50 bucks, yeah? If you manage by return on investment, you very much get an oil change because the return on investment is extremely good, right? So it's a big step ahead. So this is when people talk about refactoring and clean code and many of these things, right? Where you see it costs some money, but it has a high return. This organization will be much more likely to engage in that conversation than the first company. However, since we want to transform, right, where it gets interesting for us is sort of on the right-hand side. The CDO is a special character. Usually the CIO will not report to the CDO. CDO is chief digital officer, with all the caveats we have about digital. Right? Maybe, they, maybe they wear that watch, right? We saw. So the chief digital officer is sort of the alter ego of the CIO. This is often an attempt where the company says it's not reasonable for a CIO to do all these things at once. So I'm going to take the economies of scale and leave them with the classic CIO, probably reporting it to the CFO. I'm going to take the economies of speed stuff and move it under a CDO. It's one of those classic things that sounds good on paper, but isn't such a great idea in reality. Because now you have a new, fancy, fast IT, an old, crappy, boring, you know, cost-driven IT. And now the question is, where will your good people want to work? Right? And the old IT is the one who keeps the lights on. Right? It's a bad recipe. Right? Sounds good. So I think a lot of companies, these CDOs kind of came and went, right? people experimenting with it. And of course, the last model is IT is just like anything else, reporting right into the CDO. Why should the CIO be sort of a secondary kind of executive, right? IT is as important as anything. And what you can find in you know, this, like Google is a classic example. In eight years at Google, nobody ever talked about, nobody ever said we need to talk to the business or we need to talk to IT. Like that distinction just did not exist, right? And sometimes people say, oh, it's because it's a technology company. And I say, well, they're not a technology company. They are an advertising company, right? Where does the money come from? They sell advertising. They actually wish they sold more technology than Google Cloud, right? We're trying to catch up with Amazon, right? So Google is not selling a lot of technology, it's selling advertising. It just realized that for, its, for, for it to be successful, IT is not sort of a commodity thing that does the bookkeeping and the payments. IT is the core differentiator that lets them change the model fundamentally. Right? And that makes them as much a technology company as Allianz or not, right? or as much an advertising insurance company as they have a different way of thinking about it. So, penthouse stuff, right? understanding organizations, you will see many CIOs moving to the right. I know Lufthansa definitely did that. You will find many other sort of big companies making these shifts, and it's always a sign that somebody up at the top has understood that there's movement, and while it takes time to trickle down, I will give these companies a lot of credit for actually making big organizational changes based on that. It's a very good sign, right? You know things are moving. Let's come back to the layering. And the, one of my subliminal messages I have baked in here is, is in a sense, as an architect, as a modern architect, you need to deal with technology systems and organizational systems. Right? I already mentioned that. If you want to be successful, you cannot separate the two. At the end of the day, the technical ones are the easier ones, but they won't really take effect if you don't fix the organizational systems. Right? You have all this CI, CD, cloud, whatever stuff, <laughs> but you have a six-week approval process to approve a server, right? you have a three-month deployment approval process for a new software release, you've got nothing. Right? Now, most technical architects don't have to deal with organizations all that much, because you have to deal with people and politics and all this other tedious stuff. Like Technical systems are just a lot easier to deal with. Right? So now you have the challenge, you need to deal with all this organizational stuff. Now the silver lining is that organizational systems and technical systems actually very much follow similar rules. And that's, that's your saving grace. As an architect, you already have the right way of thinking to influence organizations, because the dynamics are well known to us, just different nouns in this. 
Let's take this, right? If there's one, one pattern, right? One architectural pattern that's always helped us is layering, right? We know like computer science is, is the field where every problem can be solved by one more layer of interaction, right? So layering always works, right? And why do we layer stuff? Well, right, the list is probably much, much longer, right? We have talking to a very smart audience, so you take that as a, my sort of hundred examples, right? But separation of concerns, clean interfaces, replaceability, right? Um, clear dependencies overall, you abstract the details away, many, many nice things that layering does. But, yeah, architecture wouldn't be so interesting if there were downsides, right? Everything has, has ups and downs. So it also brings some overhead, right? So for example, you know, I've seen layering diagrams, so each of these lines has like soap XML written on it, right? I think Frank is partly responsible for that. So, <laughs> so right, you carry a lot of translation overhead, right? Also, this thing can get its own complexity and often the changes propagate, right? It's this classic thing. All I want to do is add a small field to my user interface, but I've got to change the UI layer, the application layer, the API layer, the, the persistence layer, and the database layer, right? I, change, I end up changing five layers. So those are the downsides. Now, there's two things that are very interesting here. Nothing of these things say whether this is a technical or organizational system. <laughs> right? They apply equally well. What do you call replaceability? Outsourcing. Right? An organization being able to take a layer out, put something else in, have it clear, and you can do that because you have clean dependencies. That's the premise of outsourcing. And actually, if you don't have a clean layering, the last thing you probably want to do is outsourcing, right? Because the dependencies will kill you, right? So this applies, and we've seen all this kind of stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention local optimization, right? People will optimize locally. And as we said, you know, some of local optima is not a global optimum, right? And that is true for technical systems as well as organizational systems. Why do you need to go to the city office or somewhere need to fill out these 20 forms? Well, because they optimize their own internal processes. Once you have the form filled out, they're very efficient, right? And their balance for optimization end right there. And the cost that you have filling all this darn thing out doesn't show up on the balance sheet, right? That's local optimization. And we've seen the same thing. People need a fantastic API, fantastically easily for them to implement, but you know, fantastically difficult for you to use. Local optimization. Right? So that's message number one, right? This applies to organizations and technical systems equally much, no difference. Message number two, if we use our architecture brains and sort of zoom out a little bit, let's imagine we have one of those IQ tests, like which element doesn't fit the series kind of thing, right? What kind of nature are these sets of properties? We find that the left-hand side is much more structural kind of things, right? It's about dependencies, details, interfaces, it mostly talks about structure. The right-hand side is different. The right-hand side is more about latency, runtime, optimal propagation, right? The right-hand side, if you use our fuzzy, our fuzzy eye, the right-hand side is much more about dynamic properties of the system. Well, they're, they're different things. And that gives us a hint as to why organizations became this way. Because in a very slow-moving world, the structural properties are very handy and these dynamic disadvantages don't hit you as much because your world is very slow moving so you know, propagation and latency and this kind of stuff doesn't really hit you much and that's why organizations got to have that many layers it's rarely the case that a model that is used is bad it's usually that it was appropriate for the way things were and the world has changed and it's no longer appropriate Right? And that is the case here. You can see sort of once you turn the speed dial up, the things on the right hand side become more of a problem. If you build a layer architecture and you need to add a UI element three times a day, you're going to be cursing a lot right, about all these layers. Right? So, you know, summarizing this, right? technical, organizational architecture, same thing. Right? I can change, well, the heading doesn't even say it. Right? You, can, you can apply this equally. Right? And our thinking applies to both. Right? And in this case with layering, we see there's a difference between structural advantages and dynamic disadvantages. And those are the things that we use when we, when we are architects in the penthouse. Right? Those are the things we understand the way we think about. Very different kind of architecture. But remember, we're in the penthouse. Right? We're dealing with organizational structures, senior executives, etc. Another thing that we realize when we're up in the penthouse is that we need to look at the individual parts 
but we much more need to look at the system overall. Right? Now this is, I have a famous saying, any architecture diagram that doesn't have lines, to me is questionable, right? Because the lines define how the system functions. I kind of saw a few earlier, so yeah, I'm not going to name any names, but if you didn't have a lot of lines in the architecture diagram, think again, because the lines define the structure of the system, right? And here's a classic system. Many organizations, this will remind you of many organizations, right? How fast can these cars go? Well, like about 300 kilometers an hour. Well, how fast do they go? Well, maybe 25, right? And we've seen organizations like this. Again, a few very important, a funny picture, but a few very important, serious thoughts behind it. The first thought is that it's not about the individual pieces, it's about how the system is put together that defines the performance. So the good news is if you fix the system organization, you can often speed things up without replacing the people of the cars, right? People kind of learn how the system works, they're stuck in a certain system, so if you can fix the system, you can, you can improve things dramatically. The other thing you learn from this is, how much does it help to put more horsepower in the car? Well, nothing, right? Now, what do all organizations who want to become more digital, what do they all say? Oh, we need better people. Oh, we need to hire somebody from Google, right? We need people like Google, right? They want to put more horsepower in their engines, right? And as an architect, you have this systemic point of view, and you say, oh, it's completely pointless, right? And you know what? You know, if it didn't have a fun time driving around, the people in the Ferrari are going to leave very quickly because they don't like driving 25 kilometers an hour, right? So you've got to fix the system before you can fix the ingredients. Again, one of those architectural points of view that we know well, but we rarely apply in an organization up in the penthouse. So time to... Oops, where's my clicky here? Time to, to go to the middle years, right? So, so now we understand how organizations work, these layering, these systems, right? All this organizational stuff, we have a pretty good idea, but now we need to deal with some real architecture stuff, right? We need to deal with our complexities and all these kind of things. So it's a good time to ask, what actually defines architecture? Right, and we all know Software Engineering Institute has a whole website where all the definitions of software architecture are listed, right? Yeah, it's like usually it's a components, relationships, constraints, yada, yada, yada. Remember, I don't have a PhD, I can say whatever I like, right? It's like something like that, right? Some rough definition. So if we use those, this would qualify, right? All the components, the constraints, and the relationships are there. I mean, I put a lot of thought in this, people. I make sure the windows are in the wall. You know, the roof is on the top, right, so it doesn't snow in or rain in, right? The door goes all the way to the ground, so it's easy to go in and out, right? So I did a great job, right? I, I talked about the components, the relationships, and the constraints, right? So I should be architecture certified on the spot, right? However, we're talking about architecture in the business. And the business has a different question. They don't care so much about what the definition of architecture is. They have a very different question. It's like, would I have paid an architect for this? And the answer is probably not so much, right? And why wouldn't you, why would you not have paid an architect for this? And the answer is, it doesn't have any significant decisions. It's like sort of plain vanilla, no luck for me, right? It's just like, this is what you do. However, I see architectural pictures like this below. These architecture pictures are the equivalent of, oh, I have a front end and application, they have a database. I'm like, no kidding, right? It's like, yeah. Right? All the elements, the constraints, the relationships is all there, right? The only thing that's massively missing is any meaningful decision. And meaningful decisions also have downsides, right? A decision that has no downside is probably not very meaningful. So here's a different house, equally poor drawing, you know, credits go to me. This is a house that has glass walls. And because generally houses that are made up of glass are called green houses, you know, those are not the houses we live in, this house has a long overhanging roof to keep the sun out, right? However, in the winter when it's actually not that hot, it doesn't matter that actually the sun is low on the rise that the sun actually shines in. So what do we learn here from architecture or regarding architecture? One thing we learn is that good architecture is not complicated, right? Good architecture is not like a thousand things. Good architecture is a handful of major decisions. We make the walls out of glass and we put an overhanging roof so the sun doesn't blast out of the summer, but in the winter we're happy the sun comes in and helps us warm a little bit. Second thing we learned from this is, is that context, right? This house makes sense in certain areas, it doesn't make sense in other areas. 
Singapore, for example, we don't have summer winter, right? We on the equator, this whole thing doesn't work, right? So context is, is a very important equation. And if you think this is a little bit simple or simplistic, this is world class architecture. Right? This, these houses are well known. This is one of the case study homes in Los Angeles, popularized by uh, what's called Julius Schulman, famous photographer. You've all seen the picture. Every architect student will know this thing Hollywood Hills. Iconic, most iconic building in Southern California, right? Famous, famous, world famous, right? So good architecture is simple to the point, defines something, right? And that's what makes it famous and great architecture. Not a thousand little things, right? So very, very important, right? So it's about making decisions, right? And making simple, clear decisions and understanding the context, and that's what makes great architecture, right? Right here. Now comes the tough message. For architects, people actually don't care about the architecture so much. Sorry, guys, right? Especially me, I'm an architect, right? Because people largely don't see your architecture, right? The end users see the properties that your architecture gives the system. Does it scale? Is it easily modifiable? Right? All these kind of things. But the actual architecture, nobody sees. So instead of the architecture, people care about the properties your architecture gives the system. Now that's where the boxes and the lines come in. We see two diagrams here. You know, I like simple things, as you know this. They have the ingredients A, B, C, and D. But they're put together differently. Now, do you think these two systems have different properties? Of course, totally. It's almost the opposite of each other. On the left-hand side, easy replaceability, but maybe single point of failure, long path. Right-hand side is exactly the opposite. Short path, high throughput, resilience, but difficult to replace something. You could make a list like this. It's always exactly the opposite. Now, this means when, people, when you ask people, what is your architecture, and they say Oracle Red Logic, you know, or whatever it is, right, or ReoDB, and, and, and something rather, no JS, right, you realize how meaningless that is. Right? If people list the ingredients, right, it says nothing about the architecture. It's like going to the restaurant and it says grain, you know, rotten cow milk, and tomatoes. Right? And you don't know whether you're going to get a pizza, whether you're going to get a pasta with tomato sauce, or some sandwich, or whatever rather. Right? People name the meal, not the ingredients. Right? And likewise, good ingredients are helpful, but the chef makes the restaurant. Right? And the architect is like the chef. Like you gotta cook, you gotta put it together, right? Buy good ingredients, good idea, but putting it together right, that's what makes the world class chef and the world class architect. So in order to do that, there's a common sort of misconception, I would say. We always think about that the developers, right? There's a lot of people who say, oh, the developers deal with the functional stuff and the architect with the non-functional activities, like scalability, maintainability, all these kind of things. And I would say in my new world, that model is a little bit too simplistic, right? The, the job of the architect is not that easy. And I hinted at that with a house, with the context, right? There's this whole space around it of non-requirements. And non-requirements are not things that are not required. These non-requirements are things that are never written down anywhere. Assumptions, tacit knowledge, right? Context, like all these things, right? That were in somebody's head somewhere, but were never written down. And that's where, in my view, the architects engage. They see things the other people didn't see. And they don't deal just with written down requirements, they largely deal with the things that were never written down. And that again makes the job of an architect so interesting, but also so challenging. Right? It's a very different view, especially in these change transformation scenarios that we're talking about. Now, yeah, I gotta have one formula in my talk. So when I try to describe what really the role of architects in a large organization is, is I sell options. Right? This is Black Scholes, right? Ben Price in our economics, right? Some pretty clever folks. Options, what are options? Right? Financial options are a way to defer a decision into the future and these parameters. So I can buy a financial option to buy Allianz stock in one year for 200 euros. Today it's like maybe 180, 190, right? So in one year, exactly, I can buy it for 200. So a couple of things to consider, right? A, when one year comes, the decision whether to buy or not is truly obvious. Because when the market is more than 200, of course I take the option to buy it for 200. I have money in the bank. If it's less than 200, I don't take the option. So that teaches us that deferring decisions to the future is valuable. 
because I have more information, right? The affirmative decision, as long as I can fix the parameters, is almost always valuable because I don't lose my parameters, but I know so much more. And this formula, of course, you know, validates that. <coughs> Options have a price because they have a value. Now compare this to an architecture option. What's, what's a great example of an architecture option? Horizontal scaling, right? In the past, people used to do server sizing. And the problem with server sizing is that it only has like two possible outcomes, right? Too big or too small, right? Too big is money wasted, CFO is unhappy, too small doesn't run really well, CIO and all the other people are unhappy, right? It's just, you know, it's a guessing, it's a guessing right kind of game. Well, in the new world, what we do is we scale horizontally. As architects, we know how to make this option very easily. Stateless, elastic infrastructure, cloud, yada yada, automatic deployment, right? We all have this. So we can sell this option, right? Now, the option isn't free, right? There's some architectural complexity, some work to be done, right? So the question now is, should we buy this option? As an architect, I can sell you this option of horizontal scale. Now, the question is, should the business buy it? It's not free. Right? And not just the money you pay, but money you pay with complexity also. Right? Now the answer is relatively straightforward, and the answer is also in the formula. Here's the little sigma square. We have another one there. Okay, this is like sigma square, obviously kind of significant, and that is the volatility, right? And you can easily see this that deferring decision into the future is more valuable the more uncertainty you have. If nothing ever changes. Make a decision today or tomorrow makes no difference, right? But if you have no idea what comes, tomorrow you'll be a lot smarter than today. So volatility drives up the value of these options. And it's intuitively you know, clear for this horizontal scaling, right? If you build an internal application for three users, well, you don't need horizontal scaling. If you're building an online app that has spikes and peaks and campaigns and all that kind of stuff, right? You have 10 users to today, 10 million users tomorrow, well, this option is usually valuable, right? Now, the interesting thing is we live in a world of high uncertainty. And just having gone through this you know, kind of thought, in a world of high uncertainty, architecture is more important than ever. Right? Sometimes people believe that in an age of agility and uncertainty, you cannot pack anything down. People feel like, oh, everything is moving anyway. I just sort of go along, right? I just kind of loosey-goosey, just kind of we see how it flows, right? It's exactly the opposite. In a world with a high level of uncertainty, architecture is even more important because architecture can give you those options that are more valuable. And that takes us to the basement, right? To the engine room, let's say. And the thoughts there, you know, there's a lot of stuff, so I just have a few examples, right? One of the things that I would say has fundamentally changed in the basement is how we look at systems, right? We always like to make robust systems, right? Systems that don't break. Systems that don't break are great until they break, right? And if they break, we are the state, you know, in Germany, we're very good at this. You, know, you call customer service and you say, oh, my thing is broken. What do they say? This is impossible, right? <laughs> yeah, it cannot happen, right? And I say, well, there you go, right? So robustness is great until something breaks. So modern systems are resilient, right? They can overcome failure. They deal with failure. They're easy to fix, easy to repair, easy to recover. Now, what's important is that you build these systems very differently, right? You build these on the infrastructure, and this is mostly application and middleware. Now, it gets even more interesting. If you have systems that recover very easily, what you can do is you can inject failure to make these systems more resilient, because the more failure you have in, the more failure scenarios you play through, and then your system actually becomes more resilient. Now, this is not just application-based. This is also system-based, which includes includes the people in the organization and the mindset. One of my, my hobbies is sort of the fine analogies for architecture in real life. Like one of my most famous articles is Starbucks does not use two-phase commit, right? Because they have a high throughput messaging system, right? So same is here. You know, when you talk about robust and resilience, I always have the analogy of the firefighters, right? What do the firefighters do when there's no fire? Okay, they play cards and they polish the truck, right? But the other thing they do is, they set fires, right? They inject disturbance into the system. Now, luckily, they don't do this on the production system here. This is like pre-production, like staging, right? But in the end, yeah, they inject disturbance to make the system more resilient, 
right? So in IT architectures, this is the chaos engineering, the chaos monkey, right? We always feel we, we invented all this stuff. I feel just, just get out more people, just look at the real world, right? The real world is asynchronous, inconsistent, right? It is resilient, right? Just look at the real world a little bit more and you can learn an awful lot about IT architecture, right? Another great example, human body, right? What do we do against diseases? We get injections, immunization shots. What does that do? It injects a disturbance to make the system more resilient. Exactly the same thing, right? The human body is probably one of the most successful systems we ever created. So with that, I want to come to my end, right? So I've built a relatively long arc in terms of changing role of IT. You know, the architect elevated. What does it mean to think like an architect at, at different levels of the penthouse? Now, the sort of the dimension behind it, as I said, these modern architects live on the first derivative, right? So it's all about bringing change and rate of change. One of the most difficult things is, and we hinted at this earlier, is that it's easy to go into an organization where things are not going very well and to just believe that people must be doing the wrong thing, right? Somebody must just like, you know, they don't work very hard or they don't, don't understand the stuff or, you know, somehow it just feels you must find the problem somewhere. If you just poke around a lot, you must find the problem. The catch is that most of the time that's not how it works. And here's a classic example of how everybody does exactly the right thing, but the system is broken. So let's say you have high friction in a system, right? Just like everything is difficult to get done. A lot of approval forms, a lot of you know, proposals to be written, right? A lot of kind of things, right? So what that means is doing things costs money. And when doing things costs money, there's more at stake. Now, what is the exactly right thing to do if more is at stake? Well, you should have a few more checkpoints, right? A few more steering committee meetings, a few more project status updates, right? It's exactly the right thing to do. Now, what does that lead to? It adds more friction. So just assume the friction is high enough that running a project carries a hundred thousand dollar overhead. Actually, not such an unrealistic function, right? You need the project manager approvals, budget, it's like all that kind of stuff cost a hundred grand. Will people make a hundred thousand dollar project? No, right? Because he would pay a hundred percent tax on top. So the right logical thing to do is make bigger projects, one million dollar projects. Now you can see how the story continues, right? Because now everybody has a million dollar project. Well, the logical thing to do is you have more controls, right? So that message I really want to give to you is when you look at this, it's like a Ferrari stuck, right? It's not the pieces, it's the system that's not working. Everybody's actually doing the right logical thing. So you need to break the system. And once you break the system, you can get this running in the right direction. So the question is, why do we even deal with all this stuff? Right? Like change is such a pain in the rear. It's so difficult, all this complexity, people don't want to change, right? And here's the toughest, the toughest message is you see a mountain of gold, right? You know a better world where everything is fully automated, DevOps, agile, lean, you know, cloud, you know, secure. You know a better world, and you have an organization that's not there. The fact is, you're gonna make their life worse in the short term. You're gonna lead them into the swamp. Right, before they get to the mountain of gold. So therefore, the question is, why do you do it? And I have two concluding messages for you guys. Right? The first one is, it always gets worse before it gets better. But the second most important one is, the worse only becomes worse. And in my little example is, why do you need people to leave their little island? Global warming, right? The ocean levels are rising, so it's much better to go through the swamp today than to swim tomorrow because the worst only becomes worse. So the only way to deal with change is start today and not tomorrow. Thank you very much. So we have time for minus one question. <laughs> we need one in order to get out. So zero, shut up. Okay, thank you very much for the great presentation. So I was uh, wondering if the analogy between organizational systems and technology systems. So would you suggest to create more unikernel type of organizational systems? So in other words, that where instead of having the whole stack of the operating system transferred to the organizational system, having a unikernel, which is basically multiple smaller type of independent organizations, maybe network for a particular purpose, would that be a radical model? So there's a couple of very interesting models that help you break this area, right? I'll start with an easy one. The easy one is platform, 
right? Like you make a bigger platform where sort of all the common pieces are, and on top you build the differentiators, right? We largely call that cloud these days, right? And if you think about it, cloud is an organizational system and a technical system, right? Cloud is the ultimate version of outsourcing, right? Cloud is outsourcing, right? So that's, that's one example. So in the unikernels, I would say it's a little bit more differentiated. The key thing is all these transformations rely on other properties, right? And having these smaller, loosely coupled things gives you a lot of desirable properties in this environment, very much so. And you see this, people become free agents, right? You know, like me, right? So, so that model is becoming more popular. What is important as an architect to understand is what's the precondition? And the precondition for that is largely lower friction. Right, if you have low, so the reason large organizations work well, and you know, there's interesting books about why do we even have organizations, right? Why we do we have firms? Why are we just like not all on our own? The key argument is friction, right? Because if I want to do a business with Sharon and we have nothing to, together, we need to negotiate, make a contract, you know, money. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. Versus when we're buddies, you know, or I'm his boss, you know, just for example, right? I just tell him what to do, or vice versa. So the friction is the key element. Right? And I think if you can get the organizational friction down, then these microkernel kind of organizations become possible and they deal with this environment well. Last thought is though, if you copy that model, if you say, oh, we should be like a microkernel kind of organization, but you don't take the friction out of the organization, you're worse off. Right? And that's why this is so dangerous. People copy sort of the structures they see without understanding the enabling factors and it actually totally fires backwards. Right? And that's why this is uh, interesting. So thank you for the question. Is there one final urgent question that could not be answered in course of the next two days? <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you very much, Gregor. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry, for Thank you, guys.